thank everybody for being back uh, tonight and we appreciate your interest. As I said before we got started, for those that want to get in on it, one of the things that's hard to remember is Tuesday night, seven o'clock, be in it. That's just part of the course, but we're grateful that you're here. We have several that are in the class. And you can go back and listen to the audio recording of last week if you need to. I'm trying to take uh, this study as slow as I know how. Uh, we're actually asking who is God. And uh, that's not easy to ask. Remember, we're not trying to prove the existence of God. With the group here, we know God exists. We know Jesus Christ is the only begotten Son of God, the Savior of the world. The Bible is infallible and errant, all sufficient. Plenary verbal inspired word of God. So we're not trying to go into apologetic type things. Although there may be things we'll say that can certainly be used in that. What we're trying to do is get our mind around God, deity. Now, when I say trying to get our mind around, if we studied this next five years uh, all day long, that's all we studied about what the Bible has to say and thinking correctly with it. We're still going to find ourselves wondering. Uh, I want to emphasize a point that needs to be made, uh, and that is we cannot, because of obvious reasons, finite human beings, and that God is not revealed all there is revealed about God. We cannot completely analyze God. Uh, that's the case because we don't fully understand him. And remember what I said last week about definition. Definition involves analysis. But definition also sets something apart so that it can be distinguished, distinguished from everything else. And uh, we can't fully define God. We, can't, we can certainly set him apart on the basis of uh, revelation primarily of himself by the Holy Spirit in the Bible. And there's a lot there to understand. But after all, as we emphasized last week, Deuteronomy 29, verse 29, makes it clear that the secret things belong to God. But the things that are revealed belong unto us and our children um, forever. So we're interested in the things revealed. Now, there's God revealed in what used to be called natural theology in the world. And we mentioned that theology is the study of God. And uh, we don't mean it so much like it's come to be known as a theology department or something like that in a, in a school, but we mean literally studying God. And of course, when we, when we say that, we realize, as I've said, and I'll keep emphasizing this, we're finite, do the best we can. We can't fully comprehend him because we're not able, we're not made that way, we're finite, and also he has not uh, revealed everything there is to reveal about him. Uh, we do want to understand him as the Bible pictures him for all scriptures given by inspiration of God. I mentioned last week in the beginning that when we speak of God, we're speaking of the essence. So to say one God is to say one essence. You're speaking of what a thing is. What is God? You're not going to find the Bible just coming out and uh, expressing itself. Say, so now we're going to have a book here that was inspired by the Holy Spirit that addresses simply and only uh, who is God, what is God. But we are trying to understand God's special, I'll use that as a common term, I, could, I can say intrinsic state of existence or being. Uh, God exists, but what is it that exists? Because God exists. Uh, that's what we're trying to do. And so God can be spoken of as being itself. But to say being is to say what? That's what we're interested in. What do we mean when we say uh, the being of God, the essence of God? And when we say there is as the Bible plainly declares, there's one divine essence, then there's one divine nature. There's only three persons who possess that one divine nature. 
God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Now, I mentioned uh, on Wednesday, Sunday afternoon, those of you that J.D. mentioned this last Wednesday that got the little track by V. Howard on, on the Godhead, you'll notice on the very front of it, it says one or three. And I mentioned when I said something about it Sunday afternoon to everybody in, in the gathering that it, it primarily zeroes in on proving the Trinity. And it doesn't get into a lot of other things. It does have a lot to say in it that if you think about what it means, it'll come in on some of these things. And we will get into a specific study of the Trinity. But uh, it is more aimed at refuting the idea that there's only one person in the Godhead. Because there are three persons in the Godhead, which we shall get into. Uh, so we want to do what we can from uh, history. Uh, but as, when I say history, I should say natural history to see what God generally has revealed in the universe and his creation about himself. But mainly we want to deal with uh, what the Bible says about the essence of God. Um, so when we talk about we're going to discuss God because we speak of God's essence, his nature, uh, his, his nature being revealed to us through his attributes, then we're discussing God. And uh, the best thing we have, is I, I'll say it again, uh, you'll keep hearing me repeat it, is the revelation of God of himself to mankind in words. Uh, I might pause here and say it's rather interesting. Um, the mind, that is not, by the way, it's not politically correct to talk about the mind. Not in the secular world. They want to say the brain. Well, I think it's a big difference. <laughs> They're connected, no doubt. And it probably will remain a mystery how that the mind, uh, which is a part of our inward man, our own spirits that is made in the image of God, uh, is connected to that brain. It certainly is. But uh, that's going to be one of those mysteries, I think, that uh, will remain a mystery. And by mystery, let me emphasize again, I mean that which is unrevealed. That's all I mean by mystery. It's unrevealed. Um, thus, when we begin to talk about words think about it for a minute what what if if you have words before you what does that imply what do those words imply at least one thing they imply there's a mind there's a mind words are vehicles of thought it's the way the ideas of the mind the thoughts of the mind travel now considering how we're made how god put us together how we communicate, how we communicate with one another, and how God communicates with us, then you see that words would be the highest form of one mind, whether divine or otherwise, communicating with somebody else. That's the reason I think it's so significant when you begin the book of Hebrews uh, that you have. What is said, uh, really, the, how God in these last days communicates to us. God who at sundry times and divers manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken. What do you speak? You speak words. Spoken unto us by his son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the world. So, words, that's how we are trying to communicate now. That's how. You're trying to understand what I'm having to say. And if you respond to me at any time, you ask a question, you're going to use words. Now, there's more ways you can communicate, but it's always going to involve some sort of symbol that represents an idea that gets over to you what's on my mind. There's different ways to do that. So one of the things about having the word of God, and it implies God, if it is truly the word of God, it had to come somewhere. Where did it come from? The mind of God. And so when we study the mind of God, we study the word of God, we learn the will of God, and we learn all we can about God. Who is he? What, what can we learn about him being the one divine essence? Now, I said last week, tonight, we would uh, look at the fact that God is one divine essence and each person who makes up the Godhead 
his spirit. That's plainly declared, John chapter 4, verse 24, with Christ and the woman, the Samaritan woman as well. You'll notice in the King James Version that it says God is a spirit. That's really not the way it reads. God is spirit. He's the eternal spirit. He existed with nothing else existed, and whatever exists besides himself was brought about by him. Oh, you remember we started out last week in Genesis 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Now, there may be a lot of things we don't understand. We The, the Bible is not does not have that much information about all his creative activity regarding things unseen or in the spiritual world. Because the Bible's addressed a man on earth for the reason he's here and the condition he's in for all of sin and come short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23. Let's always remember that. I touched on this last week and what the Bible has to reveal about who God is and what God is. Because we primarily know the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are the first, second, and third members, persons of the Godhead, as it relates to our need of salvation and why we're here in the first place. Why God ever make man? Well, we, we may some, know some of that, but we don't know why God made man. Um, he didn't have to. <laughs> it wasn't obligatory upon him. Nothing in the Bible indicates it would have been. Uh you know it fits into his divine scheme of things, but we don't know all that goes on. I think I can safely say from what I do know in general from what he's revealed in the Bible that the great battle in which his children, members of the church, citizens of the kingdom of heaven, are, are engaged in began before a man was on this earth. I, I won't get into this in detail, but you remember... Satan is not a divine being. Satan's a created being. Now, somebody says, well, you mean he created him to be evil? Well, angels, spirit beings, were created for a special purpose. They have their own estate. Peter talks about them leaving that estate. Thus, they have free will. So we don't know what all went on as to why Satan did what Satan did. Somebody says, well, we're striving to get to heaven. If Satan in heaven in the presence of God sin, why once we get to heaven, can we not sin and lose heaven? Well, the simple answer to that is God said we wouldn't. And he means what he says, says what he means. But we do not, these things happen when he created these beings and uh, they have the power, at least at that point, I don't know how to put it otherwise, in heaven. To do as Satan did. Jesus said that he was a liar from the beginning. Um, the beginning that I know anything about is in the beginning God created heavens and the earth. Uh, how do you measure eternity? Well, you can. How do you measure when God began to create, even I'm speaking now, spiritual beings, uh, what we would call in philosophy metaphysical? Uh, things are not governed by time and space and material things. Well, that shows me at least, at the very least, that this matter of the problem of evil did not begin here on this earth. It began in eternity. How we fit into this battle is a lot of it's a great mystery. Uh, God had, it seems to me from the revelation in general, that God creating those spirit beings, angels, in his very presence in the high order, and they are above man, that they have no opportunity to repent once they do what they did. And Peter speaks of them being cast down and reserved in chains of darkness to be judged the last time. Uh, explain to me all of that. Well, explain means explanation, and that means there's got to be information. And I don't know that there's all that information except a general information that this thing we're involved in now in fighting the fight of faith uh, began before our time on earth. Now, their 
relationship to God. It's going to be different from ours. You remember when Gabriel revealed himself at different times as God sent him on assignments to earth? He would say, I stand in the very presence of God. Well, that tells you what kind of pe pe I should say people. That's, that's another thing. Let me pause right here since I chose people. We're also bound by man's language to try to study God. And I, we don't have anything, any language that can fully begin to describe God so that we can discuss him without falling back on terms that we use regularly that fit us where we are now. So we're handicapped even in language, to begin to grasp uh, God or in discussing God. So uh, I just want to take that moment to point out that we're speaking at this moment of the spirit world. Uh, you can find in the Colossian epistle that Paul had this to say in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 15 along this line. He said, in whom we have redemption, now speaking, of course, of Christ, through his blood, even forgiveness of sin. Now watch verse 15. Who is the image of the invisible God? Yet he's invisible. The firstborn of every creature. Somebody says, if, if somebody just wanted to, uh, to ask me, tell me as best you can, who or what is God, the one divine essence. Who is he like? What's he like? First thing I'm going to say, read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John about Jesus Christ, and you'll get the best explanation of that you can ever get. That's what Paul is saying here concerning Jesus. He is the image of the invisible God. That's why Jesus, who said last week, could say, when you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Because you know even Paul here is not saying, when you saw the fleshly body of Jesus, you saw God. No. He's talking about the spirit of the second person, the Godhead, that became flesh and dwelt among us. That is, you're talking about the God-man. This is what is so unique about Jesus, is that he's as much God as God is God. He's as much man as man is man. Now, I find that even a thing hard to grasp, and I don't think I fully grasp that. And uh, But we need to keep that in mind. Uh, He's a man as far as understanding all things that we have to deal with as human beings, because he's a human being. But he is God in that he is God and all that that implies. That's the best way I say that right now. And you got the same thing basically said in 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 17. Um, so God is a spirit. What does that mean when we say God is spirit? He's not material. Well, what does that mean when I say he's not matter, he's not material? Well, he, he can't be. He, in fact, he shouldn't be, as we try to study him, equated with any facet of the created order. We must understand that God is totally independent of his creation, whether it's angels or whether it's physical things. Uh, he is the one who originated all this in the great mind of God. When I think that much and realize here we are, and then I read in the Bible what all God did to save us from sins, in other words, the mess we got ourselves into and have nobody to blame but ourselves. What does that say about thinking of it as a man, his plans for us in eternity, for those who remain faithful? and obtain heaven. Just think of what all he's got in store. And the problem is when I say just think it, you can't even begin to think of it. So understanding God will help us understand why we're here in the first place. What do we do while we're here? Where are we going? More than that, what does God say that we should be doing? Um, in 1 Timothy 6 and verse 16, Paul is writing to Timothy, of course. And he talks about God uh, dwelling in unapproachable light. Unapproachable light. 
how do you how do you comprehend that? How do you put your mind around that? So he's not a created being. Now, this is where we touch on apologetics a little bit because people want to say, well, if, if God created everything and there's nothing created that he didn't create, who created God? When they ask that question, I promise you, they're not even thinking about God as he reveals himself in the Bible. They are thinking about something uh, like the gods of the Greeks and the Romans or the gods of the Canaanites or whatever. One thing that stands out about those gods is that they developed out of what was already created. You know anything about them at all in the study of them. But the God of the Bible created all things. And so out of man's fertile and sometimes insane imagination, he developed all these things, basically superhuman beings, and they bore all the marks of frail humanity in those superhuman beings. I found it interesting that in the last number of years, uh, what do they call in these movies they've made about these superheroes? What are they called? I don't can't remember. Anyway, you know who I'm talking about. Um, you got these people. And you got kids who wouldn't know how to spell Bible, but they're all wrapped up and all involved in them. Uh, everything's superhuman, and yet they reveal human whatever. Many of them are wicked, whatever they are. Then you got the good ones, fighting the bad ones, and saving humanity. Isn't that interesting? People come up with that. But when you talk about that in the realm of what the Bible pictures about God and about humanity and the need of a savior, they can't see that. And yet that's what they're doing when they invent all this stuff. So there is a way that seemeth right to a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. So none of the properties of matter can be predicated to him, that is God. Um, we have to say God's not a leaf, he's not a flower. He is neither in the sunset nor in the rainbow, God is absolutely alone. What am I saying? Remember God. The one eternal divine essence stands alone, separate from all substances, whether it's created spiritual substance, such as our inward man, our spirits, or angelic beings. He is unique. That is, he's different from all substances. God is not like anything that has been made for the whole essence of God is spiritual, metaphysical, and unlike angels and evil spirits for that matter. He's the great I am. Remember we talked about that last week. He doesn't have beginning. He does not have ending. He is the uncaused first cause of whom there is no other cause. Um, that's what we need to emphasize to the world today. I might say this. People don't like to think of God as being their creator because he owns us then. And he has the right to tell us how we ought to think, speak, and live. And people don't like that. I want you to think of this most of the time we think of John saying, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. Uh, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride or vainglory of life is not of the Father, it is of the world. The world passes away and the lust thereof. We usually look at the uh, lust of the eyes, or especially the lust of the flesh is being there's where we have the biggest problem. I don't really think that. You can take this for who it's worth. I really think it's a vainglory of life. To some, more than others, but with everybody, there's a struggle with pride. Think for a minute. Why won't people repent of their sins when they see they violated God's will and they admit it's God's will they violated? Why won't they? What answer to that? pride. So many times people haven't even obeyed the gospel because of pride. 
Pride, I think you will find, being puffed up as the Bible calls it. Pride, I think you will find, will be at the root of about every other kind of problem, even the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes. And it keeps us from saying, I'm the bad guy. That's the reason that it's so significant when we talk about David and how he committed as many sins as King Saul did. Well, how did he remain a man after God's own heart? Because you point a finger at him and offer him proof, and he's, he will every time be convicted of sin and say, I've sinned. That's the kind of man he was. But there's a, Saul didn't do that. Now, why didn't Saul do it? Pride. You look at Saul of Tarsus, a vehement persecutor of the church who thought they ought to be wiped out. Yet, as he said, I obtained mercy because I did those things in ignorance and unbelief. And when Jesus appeared to him, he immediately recognized what the situation was and did not try to gainsay or resist or say, yeah, but look who I am. Didn't do it. I watched the thing this afternoon, or no, I guess it was last night, and I took note of it and remarked to Jody about it. In the situation, people were guilty of various things, different people of various things. Yet in some of them, they were trying to always not admit any guilt on their part, yet they personally did what they did that was wrong. They kept pointing fingers at other people. We're sort of like children playing in a sandbox. And uh, one little boy says to the other one he's playing with, you're an old dirty dog. And the other one looks at him real quick and says, well, you're another one. And they go back to playing just happy as a bug in the rug. <laughs> what did they accomplish? Well, if I just know you're as dirty as I am, we're happy. So that's the way a whole lot goes on in this world when it comes to dealing with ourselves. So when you think of lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life, the pride of life begins in the mind, in a way of thinking, a disposition of heart. Well, that's spiritual. That's spiritual. Um, one thing that fits in when the atheist, scientist, whoever it might be, wants to say that it won't use mind. He's trying to get around trying to prove a mind. That's what he's trying to do. And since he's a materialist, he wants to say, well, I think with my brain. Um, but what does he say about the physical body or anything in the creative material world? Well, it's matter in motion. So what does he think about thoughts? You ever thought about what a fellow who thinks that there's nothing but material and material got busy of its own self and created man through multiplied billions of years of chance evolution. What does that mean about his thoughts? Thoughts aren't material. He would have to say, if he's true to his own beliefs, which many of them contradict themselves, he would have to say that all my ideas and all my thinking are just simply accidental bumping together of the molecules or whatever there is. And it hit, makes the cells in my brain do what they do. Well, would you, uh, would you want to list somebody like that? And would even a person who would be willing to state that about the implications of their doctrine, would you want to really pay attention to what that fellow said since it's just the accidental sliding of atoms and molecules in his brain cells that caused him to come up with whatever he's thinking. Certainly wouldn't use a computer that way because a computer evidence is design. There has to be a designer capable of putting it together. Well, that means there's the unseen, and that's what we noticed a while ago, the unseen. To speak of a spirit then is to speak of that which is unseen. It's not material. It has no connection with material things. Now that makes it very interesting because there's a spirit in each one of us. It's the real you. It will always exist somewhere. It is a center of your personality. Why is it that way? Because God is a spirit and made it that way. Now, God is spirit. 
the eternal spirit. Of course, he doesn't have a face like we have, or he doesn't have literal arms or literal fingers or literal eyes. But then you may want to raise the question, if, if that is the case, and it is, how does Scripture constantly speak of God as though he has a material body? Even uh, Scripture even refers to physical features such as hands and feet and fingers and face, eyes, the eyes of God. And we, you know, God sees all, doesn't see like I see. So there's ways that we have, there's things we use, we can understand. That's the reason God uses these things, because it's on our level of understanding. In that wonderful God who cannot be fathomed has revealed to us who need salvation on the way he created us to understand anything in a way that we can understand it. I think that's a marvelous thing is to show his care for us, his desire for free moral agents to be reasoned with and to draw proper conclusions if they're honest and act upon them. And of course, that means to serve God. As Isaiah reasoned on behalf of God to Israel, come, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be crimson, they shall be as white as wool. So how are we then to understand, there's that word again, understand uh, statements like that incorporate the finger of God, the voice of God? Well, this gets us to a new word. J.D. was mentioning this a few, a few weeks ago. Um, physical, physical references are considered to be what's called anthropomorphisms. Anthropomorphism. And that's just simply the method of speaking of God in human terms. I think it's interesting that when God saw fit to reveal himself as much as he could to man, he became human. So Jesus could say, when you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And made it very clear throughout his earthly ministry that I and the Father are one. Now, this oneness we've understood a little bit about when we talk about the one divine essence. Because what Christ had as far as his, or has as far as his spirit is concerned, is divine. Now, this brings up a question some people have asked. Um, you remember that uh, Philippians makes it clear in teaching us that we should have the mind of Christ. Verse 5 of chapter 2 of Philippians. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. Now, now watch this. Because we're talking about God is spirit. He's separate from everything else. He stands alone. He's without beginning or ending. He is the great I am. Anything created, he created it originally. But what we find in verse 6, who being in the form of God. When you look at John 1, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God. The same as in the beginning with God. Okay. That's saying that the second person of the Godhead is God, the eternal word. Verse 14 says, he became flesh and dwelt among us. All right. What do we find? Well, we learn one thing explicitly from this. This one divine eternal essence has a form. Now, if you start trying to think of form like a concrete form to pour steps to a porch or something like that, you'll be, you can't think that way. But Christ could give up that form that is peculiar to the one God, the one divine essence that's eternal, and come to earth to be in a human form. Now, notice I didn't say, and neither does the scripture, that he gave up being God. But we learn from this that there's a form to this one eternal divine essence. And that essence produces a nature which, of course, uh, has its attributes. 
we'll get more to that later. But that's one thing I'd point out from Philippians 2, as he teaches us humility to be like Christ who came to earth, that in doing so, he came, he gave up the form of God. And he didn't think it to be something to be grasped and held on to. And you had to drag him screaming and yelling, so to speak, out of heaven to do what he did on earth for us. He was ready to do what was necessary. And that's the reason last week that I, I pointed out to you, which I think you already knew this, that when Paul is addressing Timothy, that he speaks of there's one mediator, or there's one God, and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Now, Paul wrote this many years after Christ went back to heaven and sat on the right hand of God. Does he, I won't expect an answer from you, but I'll ask the question, jog your memory. Anybody remember what we said last week about Jesus being the God-man and that when he went back to heaven, he did not cease to be the God-man? And Paul says all those years after he went back to heaven, he says he's still the only mediator between God and man. Who is it? Man. Jesus Christ. That also lets us know even further how much he loved us. Because once he took upon himself a form of a man, he kept it. That's the reason that God has appointed him to be the judge of man. He is the judge. We all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ to give an account of the deeds done in the body, whether good or bad. So Paul tells the Corinthians. So uh, he is forever the God man. Now we pointed out last week that, of course, Christ is glorified now. Remember, he prayed in the garden, uh, Father, glorify me with the glory I had with thee before the world was. Yet, he remained being a man, God, man. Yet he was glorified as he was before he left the form of God, took upon himself the form of a man, before he became a God man, before the word became flesh and dwelt, John says, among us. We beheld his glory. Glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth, John 1, 14. Now, that within itself is another one of those things that you can research and think about for a long time and try to figure it. Why would God do that? Why would the second person of the Godhead, who's always pictured in the Bible as the one who executes the Father's will, he's the executor of the Godhead. Uh, God, the Father, is always pictured as the originator truth is the best way to put it, and the Holy Spirit, third person of the Godhead, is always pictured as the revealer and the organizer and the confirmer of truth. So that's interesting. Why would God in three persons have different things to do? I don't know. <laughs> I have no idea. That's the reason I say we know God principally on the basis of how we need to know him as it regards our salvation. When this world is long turned to nothing through God's power and the saved and resurrected glorified bodies, even as Christ's body is glorified now, when we're in the presence of God, will God still be, be revealing himself as we see him differently? Because we'll be in his presence from what we see him now. Since we know he, he can't be fully revealed to us, we couldn't comprehend him. He is pictured as light to which no man can approach. So great, 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 tremendous transformation he will have to make upon us in order to be in his very presence. But at least it should whet our appetite to make us understand more what's going on, but when we go to heaven, we won't become God, we won't become angels. I hear a lot of people today talking about, oh, you know, we go to heaven and be an angel. No, you won't. Do you realize, and let me emphasize this, because we're talking about spirit beings. <clears throat> angels, as we think of Gabriel and Michael, and angel means from angelos, means a messenger, which means even a servant of God in the area and for the purpose he made them to serve their estate, their first estate. 
uh, do, do you realize that those angels have no concept of salvation? We sing some songs sometimes that make it sound like the angels understand exactly what we're doing. No, they don't. They don't understand about sinning and repenting and being forgiven. They don't have that. It's not indicated they do. They don't, under, they don't understand the scheme of redemption. You, you'll find that uh, Peter uh, talks about how they desired to look into, understand what was going on. I think sometimes, um, I think sometimes that we think because a thing is a being is a spirit being and higher than we are and supernatural, it must be just like God. No, let's get that straight. We're discussing that one divine essence is revealed generally in uh, natural theology and specifically as much as possible in revelation. Then one thing stands out. God's separate from everything. So angels don't, are not uh, omniwise. They're not omniscient. They're limited in knowledge. Uh, Satan didn't know how it's all going to turn out as far as Christ. And yet God had already predicted to us in Genesis 3.15 that, that the seed of woman would bruise his head after he had bruised the course, which turns out to be Christ in the sense of cause his death. Satan thought he was victorious when he got Christ killed. He didn't understand all that. So what, do you, what does he do after Christ is raised, the church is established? Now remember, the, the church is the spiritual body of Christ. To it, all those who obey the gospel, Christ adds. So what is the attack? Christ is back in heaven, sitting at the right hand of God, with all authority in heaven and on earth, and ruling over his kingdom. What do we have? Well, he's trying to attack the church. Thus, we have to realize the individual members of that church, the church to which Christ added us, he purchased with his blood, as members of a spiritual body, he's after you, he's after me. But we have a God who can't be touched by these things. And we need to keep that particular point in mind. So keep in mind these, uh, these physical references to God and why they're there. They're to help us understand anthropomorphism, method of speaking of God in human terms. Now, let me very quickly, I've got about three minutes before I start questions. Um, Psalm 139, 16. I, want to, I may have to stop here. We'll come back to it next week, Lord willing. Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed. Psalm 139, 16. Now, he's not talking about you saw my substance with literal eyeballs as we're made to see things in his physical body. Um, this is, I think a rather clear reference to God's knowledge of the smaller, uh, smallest detail of the future. The eyes of Jehovah are the Lord are in every place, Proverbs 15, 3. Now that's just simply saying God knows everything that happens in all places. Those are what that divine essence is. So God is not literally like that. In other words, he doesn't have literal eyes like we do. Um, and we need to understand that. And when we're teaching the class that has these things in it, we need, to, uh, we need to bring that out. So because God is spirit and thus invisible, we're not to make any graven image or any likeness that represents God. It's very important. You'll notice in all that we do in the church, there's nothing that we look at as far as a material object that says this is God. It's not there. We let the word of God a proper understanding and right division of it form our understanding of God. Well, I'll quit here and we'll go for questions if there are any.